study. Uh, we get to see things in your word tonight that strengthen our faith. And we pray that you would keep back the termites from going nuts on us while we're, uh, while we're studying so we can focus on your word. But thanks for letting us be together. Just make it a sweet time for us to grow in you. In Jesus' name we ask. And everyone that agreed said? Amen. Amen. So guys, Revelation chapter 1, the last book of the Bible, is uh, I think one of the coolest because it tells the foretelling of what's going to happen in the last days on the earth. And God did this a lot in the Bible. You know, in the Old Testament, he'd say, like in Ezekiel, he said, I'll tell you what will happen before it happens, so that when you ha when it happens, you'll know one thing. Do you guys know what one thing he kept repeating that he, they would know? That I'm God. That I'm that I'm God. Like it wasn't, um, you know, like it was it was a sign to say, look, I know stuff, and I can do stuff that no one else can do. One of the kings, um, Hezekiah, got sick with an illness in the Old Testament. And the prophet was told by the Lord, go tell him, get his house in order. It's time for him. He's going to die. And so he, you know, the prophet goes and tells him, is this, it's actually, it says, the prophet was the king's friend. This king was a really upright king. He's one of the best kings in the Old Testament. And, um, and his friend, do you guys know the prophet's name? Do any of you guys know the story? You know who it is? Not Nathaniel, no. His name is Isaiah. And he goes and... I like it because he has my, my nickname, is. So, but uh, Isaiah goes to him and tells him, get your house in order. And he says, um, he says, what, why? What have I done wrong? I'm a good king, you know. I, I fear the Lord. And, you know, I want to, you know, like live a full life and live longer. And So Isaiah says, well, I'll go talk to the Lord and, you know, can ask, and so he goes and he comes back and says, the Lord has said, he's heard your prayer, your petition, and he's going to give you 15 more years. You get to live 15 more years on the earth. And, and he goes, well, how do I know it's true? And so the prophet says, what would you like? Would you like the shadow that's on your stairwell? The guy's in his, you know, on his deathbed. And he gets there and he says, Nope, you're not going to die. The Lord says he's going to let you live 15 more years. Well, how do I know it's true? He says, well, you, do you want the shadow to decline or or ascend? Which which way would, you know, and he's like, well, it would naturally go, you know, as the sun goes down, it's going to go that way. So I want it to go the other way. Like, make the sun go backwards 15 steps. Like, you know, just to show off. Like, how do I know? So he, he says, okay. And the shadow went the opposite way of this, you know, like the sun backed up in the sky. And he went, okay. And if you guys read the Bible, you know, he does live 15 more years. So the Lord gave him 15 more years. And it was really cool that it was like the Lord saying, look, I know what's going to happen before it happens, and I can do this. This isn't hard to, does that, like, freak God out? He goes, oh, wow, I don't know if I can tell you, you know, stuff ahead of time. Like, it's really different. Wait, wait, what we're going to see tonight is, Jesus is introduced as the Alpha and the what? Omega. Omega. Okay, the beginning and the end. We saw, we saw last week, um, actually God was called that title, the Alpha and the Omega. That's Greek for, Alpha is the first letter of their alphabet, in, in the Greek alphabet, and Omega is, you guys know this, right? Do you guys study any Greek? You don't have to study any. Do you have to study any languages anymore? Yeah, I did four years of French. French, Okay. Well, in Greek, um, I guess just because when you go to college, you, you have to get exposed to the Greek fraternity system. So if nothing else, you learn a bunch of you learn you, you learn a bunch of the Greek alphabet because they use the letters on the fronts of their buildings. So you know, you're, yeah, you you be like the 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 Sigma Pi or whatever um, fraternity or sorority group it is. They have maybe a couple Greek letters on their building. So. Eventually, whether you like it or not, you, you make a friend that is in that fraternity or that sorority, and they tell you the name of the building, and it's like, what kind of name is that? And they're like, it's two Greek letters. So I slowly learned different Greek letters just because of, you know, attending university. You just There's a bunch of these fraternities and sorority houses, 
and they're all got that's how they tell you which which house are you in oh, I'm in the you know in the one with the and if you don't know Greek letters you're like huh and they're like you know, I'll show you and they draw it you know or they draw it on you look for this and you can always see the guys looking for a party because they're like looking at the building <laughs> looking at the building look up hey that doesn't look like the right letter you know and they and they find their way finally to the to the sorority or the or, or the fraternity house so in the Bible though they kind of stole some of this stuff for their fraternity system from different verses in the Bible. This is one of them. In the book of Revelation, when God declares, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega in verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So, I'm from the beginning, Alpha, and to the, and to the Omega, the end. Now, that's God declaring that about himself. And tonight we're going to go on and see what it says. John's going to say he's the one who's going to receive this, this revelation from the Lord. Now, this is a really cool thing, but just to put it into context, do you guys know when this book was written about? In, you know, A.D.? 77, No, the Re book of Revelation is about 96 A.D. So, um, did you say that? Oh, that's good. That's close. I mean, if you just said it in the 90s, you're doing good. Okay, so Jesus dies at how old? 33. So 33 AD, he dies. I mean, we mark time when he was born. So at 33 AD, he dies. This is, you got to add, you know, 63 more years of time that passed. And John was the guy we studied about a couple weeks back that they actually... The Apostle John, they actually tried to kill him for preaching the gospel. And they put him in oil to boil him to death. And he didn't die. And they're like, he's in the, like, like it's a jacuzzi. Yeah, this is really nice. And he's like, this guy won't die. So they banish him to the island of Patmos. It's like a, kind of like a penal colony, you know, like putting him on this rock out there in the middle of the sea. And it's kind of like we would say Alcatraz of the day. It was like, here you go, you get locked up at Alcatraz. And so he's there. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because John is the one, you know, when, when I took literary classes, we had, to, we had to answer a few questions whenever we studied any literary work. First question, who wrote the book? Second question, you know, when, what time period was the, you know, the, the book or the setting in? You had to learn something about, you know, and does that make any difference, by the way, if you know who wrote it and when they wrote? And then, and the last one was, to whom were they writing? Okay, if you know the audience, who they're talking to, it, it kind of can change the whole storyline or the, or the amount of stuff you get out of it. If you know this letter that was written was written, you know, during the wartime, and it's a, a guy, a GI, writing back to his future um, bride, and he's writing her a, a love letter, and he's in the trenches, and they just blew up his buddies, and, you know, it's 1941, and you, like, know some of these details, and then you read the letter. Because you could read a letter like, uh, you know, Dear Sally, blah, 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 and you're like, this isn't really, you know, I don't really get much out. But if you know the, the background, and you know who's writing, who they're writing to, and, and what's going on, you might pick up clues in, in the letter that you would have just skimmed right over. You wouldn't know some of the stuff that, you know, is significant because you don't know the setting to the story. So I'm trying to do the same thing with you guys tonight. In, in the book of Revelation, this is a really cool letter. But this letter has, um, it has, who, who, who's writing the letter? John the Apostle, okay? And he's the one that is going to pen it. And he's going to, here's what he says about how he got this. Re now, Revelation, the word Revelation is like, um, it's from Greek, apocalypse. Or the peeling back, the revealing it. Pulling back curtains and saying, ta-da, look behind the curtain, you know. Like opening the stage to see something. This is only, this is like kind of like peeling back the sky that we look at. And seeing what, what's behind, what's behind the sky. Like, how far is heaven away, do you guys think? Like, really far away? 
in your mind, like when you picture heaven, how far do you think it is? Like way out there in the cosmos, you know, a couple extra galaxies over, you know, millions and billions of light years away. I mean, when, when we think about heaven, I always thought when I was growing up, is way, way out there. Somehow it's like so far away out in the galaxies. Maybe it was because, you know, I grew up during the era of Spock and Star Trek and, you know, it just like seemed like the right place to put heaven because they were getting the starships and exploring, you know, strange new worlds. I thought, well, heaven's out there somewhere, you know. And, and that's just the way my brain did. But I didn't pay attention to what the Bible said. Because in the Bible, it says in the book of Acts, but I want to show you this part and it'll really tie into the book of Revelation. Turn with me to, keep, keep one just hand there, Revelation 1, and turn... Turn to the book of Acts to chapter 1. Okay, now Acts is the book that takes place. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Acts. Okay, and the, so you have four Gospels written by four different Gospel writers. And then you, have, then you have the book of Acts, which takes place, basically, it's written by Luke. He, Luke, Luke, Luke wrote the book of, uh, of Luke, the Gospel of Luke and told all the things Jesus began to do and teach. And then and then Acts, you can actually, I just call it Luke 2. Like, Luke continued, okay? Because it really is. It's written by the same guy, Luke. But it's all the stuff that happened after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And then what happened with the early church. So this book is like kind of one of the cool, I mean, this... This will, you tell me how far heaven is away when these guys um, get to see something here, okay? Watch this. It says here in, in the book of Acts, it says, Then Jesus, after these things, he said to him in verse 7, It's not for you guys to know the times or the epochs. They, they asked him, I'm sorry, in verse 6 they said, uh, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now Jesus has risen from the dead, been going around showing himself alive with many different convincing proofs. He's had supper with people. They're like, it's a ghost. He's like, it's not, not a ghost. Look, give me something to eat, remember? And he gets some fish, and, and he doesn't do, like, Casper maneuver, you know. He, he, did you guys ever see Casper the ghost when you're... Yeah. Did they have that cartoon anymore? Yes. We used to we used to watch it, and Casper would try to eat something, and as soon as he put it in his mouth, it would just fall through him and plink on the floor, and you're like, it doesn't really work. So, But this, it's so funny that they do that in a cartoon... Because it's in the Bible. When Jesus shows up and they go, it's a ghost. He goes, I'm not a ghost. And they're like, uh, kind of like, how do we know? You got something to eat and he eats it and it doesn't fall through him. You know, you got something to drink, he drinks it. doesn't, you know, like Casper, glug, 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 and, and there's a puddle underneath him because it just <laughs> went through him, you know. It doesn't do that. He, he was showing them, I'm real. I'm risen from the dead. Now, there was that guy... Doubting Thomas, who said, I'm not going to... All the other guys got to be in the room and see him risen, but they, he's like, I don't believe it unless I stick my finger in the hole in his hands. Because they said, we saw him. He's got the holes in his hands. He's got the hole in his side where they shoved that spear in him. It's him, and the holes are in his feet. Thomas says, you can tell how, how tight these guys were. Yeah, right. I don't believe you guys I, until I stick my finger. So eight days later, Jesus appears and says, Thomas... Be thou no longer unbelieving, but be believing. And he said, reach your finger here. And he put his hand out, let him put his finger right into his... Now some people knock him. I'm so glad he's there, because I'm a tactile learner. You know what that is, right? So, but you learn by touch and doing stuff. And You can tell me all day about how to fix an engine, but I prefer to like watch and then get my hands in there and learn. I learn better if I actually... Once I turn something apart and put it back together, I'm like, I got it. I see how it works. You know, learning goes on in my brain. It works, okay? But Thomas is in the Bible. He's our tactile learner. He's like, I don't believe you guys. I got to touch him myself. I got to... And Jesus went, go ahead. And he's like, oh. Now that... I'm thankful he's in the story. Because that would have been me back then. Let me touch. Let me see. I want, you know... Now, how did John ever get to touch Jesus before he was resurrected? The guy writing the book of Revelation. Did he ever, was he ever that close to Jesus, or did he only see Jesus? Do you guys know? 
How close was John? There, there was three guys, Peter, James, and John, that were called the inner circle. They were always around Jesus. And at the Last Supper, John says he was the one leaning on Jesus' breast, right onto his chest, like, they're, they're reclining it. So the, in, the, in the Middle East, they don't eat like we do, like proper up at a table with, you know, because they have what you call family-style food, with the big dish in the middle, and you get this homemade breads, and you tear them, and you, you use your piece of bread like a, a scooper. And you, you get like a piece of pita bread, it's a little pocket, and you're like, ooh, that piece of that potato and that carrot, I'm going to get that, and that chunk of lamb, and just like kind of scoop it, and you like get your own little mini sandwich, eat it, grab some more, tear off some more bread, and just, and so the meal is presented family style. But also, I like how they do this, they also, it says, recline at the table. So they're like, kicking back. Eat. That's, I think that's what we're made to eat, you know, <laughs> in a nice relaxed position. Just, I never did go with sit up straight and, you know, use your manners and here's your little forks and things. I, I like that more casual. So that's how Jesus, John spent his last meal with Jesus at the Last Supper. So he's like, I know him. I was right there. I took right, right next to him. And John says, after 40 days... He's been going around showing, Jesus has been sh showing himself alive. And the first person he showed himself alive to, do you guys know who it was? When he came out of the grave? Who's the first person? Mary, right? And Mary sees him, and so she, the Lord tells her, go tell the disciples. I'll meet them up in Galilee, you know? And I, I'm risen. And so she runs and tells them. And to them, they think she's like gone cuckoo. What? Because nobody's, up to this point, how many people have risen from the dead? It's like kind of Jesus like setting the tone. This is like a big deal. So he rises, and then it says for the next 40 days he goes around showing himself alive to different people. Now, I don't know why they don't put that in the movies, because that would be a really nice touch. You know, Spielberg could really have fun with that one. Here's Jesus, shows up at the door, knocks. Hey, guys, you know. And, and do you guys also know that it says there were also all the the bodies of the saints that had died waiting for the Messiah, they also rose after him. So you had all of, all of these, you know, people rise from the dead, and I can just see it, you know, aunties and, and grandmas showing up at the door, Hi, honey, I'm back, you know. <laughs> They're like, what? Yeah, Jesus, Jesus came and said, you want to get out of here? And, and he led us out of, out of captivity, we were waiting for him. And here we are. We're risen. What happened next, though? Do you guys know? What happened to Jesus after the day of Pentecost? Do you guys know the story in the book of Acts? Oh, he ascended. He ascended. To where? This is the part. Right. Verse 9, it says, Then after this, it says, Jesus said, You guys... They wanted to know if he'd restore his kingdom. He said, It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you, sh you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Then after this, that he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. Who's the two guys? Any clue? Angel. Two guys in white, yeah. Two angels show up. And they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So, Or the King James in the same manner. So... What happened? The sky parted. He ascends right into heaven. They watched him. And he goes and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So he, I always thought heaven was like far away, but if they were seeing it, right, how far away is it? It's more like, like when, um, you know, some of the sci-fi movies, when E.T. shows up or something, and it's, you know, they just, you think it's so far away, but it's like right there. And it just, it's just hidden. It's like the spaceship that can cloak or something. You know, it's right there, but you don't know it. Heaven, heaven, I don't think heaven's far away, guys. 
It's right there. <laughs> and we're just like, the termites are coming to me. <laughs> Come on. Ah, part of the fun. So, so in the book of Revelation, later we're going to see Jesus is going to return. And the way he returns, it says the sky is going to be rent in two. It's going to peel back and open up, and he's going to come riding in with his armies, and he's going to he's going to return. Now, his first coming, it says he came humbly to pay for sin. And you guys know he came as a baby and, and went through the whole thing to become the Lamb of God to take away sin. But his second coming won't be the same. His second coming is the part that... See, if you're not... If you're not familiar with Old Testament scriptures, the, the Jews, they they have, the way they figured it out, this is the, their understanding. They go, well, there's, there's this description of a Messiah that comes and he's a sacrifice for our sins. He pays for our sins. And it's got to be the lamb that takes away the sin, yeah, yeah. And, and they like that guy. He's, you know, that's nice and all. But there's this other guy they, that's described. And you know that Messiah, right? That Messiah is the one that comes and delivers them from oppression and all the bad, wicked, you know, things. And he sets up his kingdom and he rules. And that's the, that's the, remember the disciples are going, is it at this time you're going to set up your kingdom? And Jesus says, no, not yet. It's not for you to know that. So John was there. John watched Jesus go into heaven. But how did he look? You know, he's in it. He's in his body, got the holes, right, in his hands. He goes up into heaven. And if that's the picture that you have, that's the last picture John had of him going up in there. John knew what he looked like physically when he was on earth. But when we read this, you tell me if John describes... John is about to write to us about Jesus, the Jesus who's in heaven. And his description... Tell me if it sounds like the description of what he saw 60-some years earlier. Okay? Let me show you this. Look at Revelation chapter 1 now. And it says here, John said in verse 9, I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker in tribulation, and in the kingdom, and, and the perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, which is, uh, he says, because, well, of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I, I got in trouble for preaching, basically. So I was in the Spirit, he said, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, write in, in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now these churches we went over before, but these are located where? Jerusalem? No. 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 Yeah, the, uh, north of Jerusalem in Asia Minor. This is in the area of what we call the, predominantly the area of the of the Gentiles, the not the not Jewish people. And so he says, write this in a book. Now, John, he came to follow Jesus in Jerusalem. But if you don't know history, this is ninety six A D. And what happened to Jerusalem in seventy A D? Are you guys familiar with this? It was, taken, it was, yeah, it was taken by the Romans. They sacked it. They just, they just drove the, I mean, Jews had to flee for their lives. And from that day until 1948, the Jews didn't really possess the, the physical land over there. In, in, they called it Palestine after that because the Palestinians took over because God said, I'm going to judge you Jews. God sent them the Messiah, and they rejected him. And so he goes, they were broken off from the, from the, from the olive tree. They're the, the cultivated branches. And wild branches, these Gentiles, were grafted in. And then later, Paul, when he writes the church at Rome, he says, don't you guys get prideful and think, I'm so good, God grafted me in. You know, good thing he has us Gentiles, because he says if God would break off natural branches, what would he do to us if we quit believing? Paul gives us like real strong rebuke. You better stay, keep believing, because even God didn't spare the natural branches. Now, is God done with the Jews? No. 
Bible says that after the fullness of the Gentiles come in, after that last person who's a Gentile gives their, their life to Jesus, then God knows that person. I'm just wait. I don't know who they are, but if it's one of you guys, hurry up and do it, please, because I'm like waiting for the story to, you know, it gets really cool after that. And, uh, and God's going to turn his attention once again fully to the Jews. But he's not done with them. they got a whole another part of the saga. But for this particular moment in the book of Revelation, there's going to be a lot of attention on the church. Okay, the, the believers. Now, church means they could be Jewish believers or Gentile believers. Together we're just made one family in Christ. And so, it's not. there's no distinction. Paul said there's no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no, you know. In God's eyes, we're all his children. He doesn't, like, make a, make a special distinction. But there is some pretty cool things when you know this that help you learn it better. So, I'll try to point them out as we go. But here, J Jesus then says, or John says in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And, and having turned, he said, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest was a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, like a, a waterfall, like, you know, that... that really powerful thundering of the of the water coming down. He says, And in his right hand he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Now when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. He says, The living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. And as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. He says, the seven stars, they're seven angels to the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So he gets a, John says, I turned to see this, this voice that was speaking to me, and I saw the Son of Man. Now when he describes this title, Son of Man, that's like a, a title for Son, you know, the Son of God. It's a, it's a pretty cool title. And he, he says, I, I saw him, but when he starts to describe him, he doesn't describe him like he described him 60 years earlier. You know, when he saw him risen from the dead, he doesn't say, and he had the holes in his hands, and he looked like, you know, well, he ate with us, you know, we gave him some fish, and and it was, we weren't sure, and then we, then when he broke the bread, we knew it was him, and, you know, when Jesus moved around on the earth right after he was r risen, before he ascended, he actually walked with two of the disciples, like, for a long ways, and at and they were heading out of town. And it cracks me up because they're walking along and Jesus goes, Why are you guys so sad? And they're like, Are you the only guy visiting Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on at this time? That's the road to a man. Yeah. And, he, and remember? And, and the two guys are like, um, Don't don't you know what ha happened? And he's like, um, No, what happened? And he plays dumb. I mean, like, did he not know what happened? They're like, well, we thought Jesus was going to, you know, he's the Son of God, and he was going to save us, and he was going to deliver us, and, and he did all these miracles, and he was mighty, and, and he was a great teacher about God, and and then she's like, Jesus doesn't even go, oh, thanks, guys. He just keeps walking with them and says, wait a minute, didn't it say in, in, the, in the law of Moses that the, the Messiah was supposed to come and suffer, and then the prophets, pro and he gives them the whole study about how the Messiah had to come to die for their sins. Well, they get all the way to they get all the way to Emmaus, and they they're like, "Come and eat with us, you know. Come on in. It's dark." And 
he acts like he's going to keep going. I'm like, oh, no, no, you got to, Middle Eastern culture, you got to, you know, hospitality. No, no, sir, you got to come and eat with us. And so they get him into the table, and as soon as he, he, he's at the table, it says he, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And they went, wait a minute. We only know one guy that does it like that, you know, who does that. And, and their, it says their eyes were opened, and they realized who it was. And then he vanished. And I'm like, <laughs> and they, then they go, they go high tailing all the way back to Jerusalem to, from Emmaus and say, we've seen the Lord. And oh man, you should have heard the study. Now this is the one study when we get to heaven, I'm going to be like, could you replay the tape, please? I, I want to hear the study that Jesus taught to the guys while they were walking, you know, because I know it was good. Because it says in Exodus, their hearts were burning within them. While he was speaking, I mean that's like what you call like seriously moving study. They were like so, oh man, that was really good. Yet it doesn't tell us all the stuff he said. It's like, oh man, I gotta, I have to wait all the way till I get to heaven to hear the whole, you know, full. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm like, Lord, can we get popcorn and just sit back and? Because I'm sure it's not gonna be like our TV screen. It'll be like 3D, you know. Like, like we were there. We'll just be like time transport. <laughs> we'll watch the whole thing and, and, and move around. I, I, think, I think, I mean, this is my own understanding, but I think it'll be like we, we go back in time and see it and what we get to walk along and, and actually see them, you know, and see what they're doing and listen and hear the whole thing. And maybe, I hope we get to even hear what they were thinking, you know, because sometimes in the movies how they do that, you know, the characters, like, not say anything, but you can hear his voice. You know, they, they dub in his voice saying, man, that person's really nuts, or, you know. They, and they don't say it, but it, it gives you a little extra. Into, so I want to know, what were they thinking, you know, when they were walking with Jesus? But did they, my question is, did they recognize him when he first rose from the dead? No, it's like he could, he could conceal his identity. They're, even though he's walking with them, they don't. They don't get it. Whether whether he just made it where their mind was, you know, he did one of those Star Wars Jedi mind tricks and made them where they didn't they didn't perceive who he was until he broke the bread. Or I am not the Messiah. You were looking. <laughs> yeah, not the Messiah. <laughs> but but whatever he did, they didn't get it until he broke. Till he wanted them to. As soon as he wanted them to, boom, their eyes were open. Then he vanishes. Goes, shows himself alive to someone else. And they're just like, wow, yeah, I can't believe he's alive. He said, but John was one of the guys who saw Jesus risen after, after he rose, during that 40-day period of going around. He was, he was one of the guys that got to have a couple encounters with the resurrected Jesus. But he doesn't write anything about the description of that Jesus 60 years earlier that I can see lines up with what he sees here. Okay? What he sees here, this is why, by the way, the Jews, they, they like the verses that say the, the Messiah will come in power and might and deliver us and set up righteousness and, and, and his kingdom. and you know, That sounds really good. But when you study about Jesus, how he came to the earth the first time, how did, and by the way, they believed it. There's a Messiah that will come and pay for sin and take on a human form and, and be a sacrifice and everything. But if you were really oppressed, I mean, you're like, the government is, is really oppressing you and they're, and they're, you know, imprisoning you and taxing you to death and it's just unjust what they're doing. And, and you had a choice. You're a good Jewish, good Jewish kid and you're like, hmm, there's this, the, the Messiah who delivers from oppression or the Messiah who pays for my sin? Which one would you want to show up first? If you were like really being picked on? I know which one I want. And by the way, were the Jews being picked on at this time when Jesus showed up? Yeah, the, the Romans had t rolled into town and just took over. They took away the, the Jews... Um, Basically, they said, you can't have the right to, to punish someone with capital punishment. We're the Romans, only we're allowed to do that. We take that right away from you. You want someone to be punished with punishment of capital punishment? 
then you have to bring it to us. In other words, like we are, our authority trumps all your authority. We have just put you beneath us. And that's what Rome did. Whenever they went and conquered, they said, look, we're the ultimate authority. And so the Jews' authority had been taken, it's like someone took their power away. And you're like, these Romans are really oppressive. And they tax us and they do all these things to us. We sure like these verses about the Messiah who's going to deliver us. Now, you guys know in the, you see Bible stories, right? And then Jesus, when he came the first time, he didn't look like the guy who's going to, you know, set up his kingdom right then with power and authority, you know, not, not like the description, but this description right here, to a Jew, if they really had an ear to hear, they would love this one. Because how does he look when John sees him here 60 plus years later? What's he look like? I mean, how's, how's his eyes? Like flames of fire. How, 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 how bright is his face? Like the sun. How bright are his feet? Did you guys catch that? It says like his feet were, were like bronze that had been burnished. Like, no, you take bronze and you heat it until it's glowing red hot. That glowing kind of goldish color that comes off the, of the glowing metal. He says, that's how, that's his feet. And he's got this robe on and a sash. And he, he doesn't say anything about holes in his hands and, and looking like, he just says, he, he's, he's just, his voice, how does his voice sound? Now John knew what Jesus' voice sounded like on earth. But he says, man, his voice now sounded like the sound of many waters, like, Many waterfalls coming down. Whoa. Super powerful. And he says, and in his right hand, in his right hand, what did he have? This is really, this is the most important part for tonight. Besides looking at Jesus. I love looking at Jesus. I mean, that's the most important. But there is one cool thing. He's holding something. What's he holding? Seven stars. Uh, no, it says he's holding, look, look at it. Right yeah. Hand, he seven stars. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, he he's holding seven stars, and out of his mouth he has a sharp two-edged sword, right? And then it says, he he. How does that work? What's yeah. that? How does that work? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a verse that says the word of yeah. I mean, John's just describing what he saw. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I mean, something tells me this is what you call seriously awesome if you fall down like a dead person when you see this. I mean, and just go, oh, it was such a nice revelation. It was just, you know, it was like seeing angels. And You know, sometimes when people describe to me that they had an angelic vision and, and I'm like, what the angel look like? You know those little um, porcelain things? What, what are they? Babies. Yeah, the little baby things Precious with the moments. pink pastels. Precious moments. Yeah, it looked like precious moments. I said, I got news for you. You didn't see a real angel. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? I said, well, every time in the Bible a real angel shows up, he has a lead-in line. Do you know what his lead-in line is? When he show, when As soon don't as a real angel... Do not be afraid. Why is the first thing you have to say, do not be afraid? I mean, why do you say, do not be afraid, as soon as you show up? They look scary. Because it freaks people out. They're like, whoa, that... that you know, they don't go. I mean, if if a precious moment angel showed up and said, "Do not be afraid," you'd look at it and go, "I'm not." You know, flick, you know, like you wouldn't be afraid, right? But if a real angel shows up, the, they they store up their conversations with, "Fear not," or "Do not be afraid." I mean, something about their their very presence freaks out people. Here's John who sees Jesus now, and yet he falls at Jesus' feet like a dead man. And Jesus, what did Jesus have to do for him? Did you guys see it right there? Well, he put his hand on him, it says, and, it, and, and said, do not be afraid. I am the, la the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now this part is one of my favorites. I mean, 
No, there's. He took the keys of death and Hades away from the from the devil. Said, no more snag. It's mine. Nobody. Uh, I'm in. in other words, saying I have the power over death and Hades. What is Hades? Do you guys know? Because later in this book we're going to see. The waiting. He, yeah, the the waiting room, where um. It's not hell. It's kind of like pre-hell. You know, purgatory is the way the Catholic word I was taught when I was when I was a young kid. Purgatory would be the concept, even though it's not the exact literal translation. Don't say I taught Hades purgatory. Just just the concept is the same. Okay, but Hades and death at the end of the Book of Revelation. Guess what? They're gonna get chucked into Gehenna. That's the Greek word for what we translate hell, the eternal lake of fire. Those two get swap they're they're like goodbye it's like throwing him into the everlasting furnace you know bye poop and yeah Yeah. and it's gone you know i know the guy who did lord of the rings read a lot of bible stuff because he's he wove in so many little things from the from the scripture in that in that story well here look at this then he says therefore write these things now next week we're going to go over the stuff he's told to write. But it's basically the stuff he's seen, the stuff of the things which are, and the stuff which will take place after that. So it's broke down into three categories. Okay? Things that are, like, it's kind of like present stuff, uh, what, 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 what he's seen, I don't know, I'm sorry, I didn't say the What he just saw, the past, the present, the things that are, and then what? Things that after that would be... So we say, what what is it in his past, present, future, right? Write these things. Like, you you just saw this, past. Now, write this stuff was, which will, the things what are, the present, and now what's going to be... Yeah, what is to come. Okay, that, that's a better way to say it. So he says, so write this stuff down. Now, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, Anyone held seven stars in your right hand before? All the time, right? Put them on my ceiling. And it says, he says the seven, <laughs> the, the seven glowy, glow, yeah, the little glowy sticks. Those are the best. He says the seven glowy, the seven glowy little stars. <laughs> he, he says are seven angels to the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the churches. Remember, um. I'm going to end with this verse. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talks about, um, you know, taking a lamp, and you don't take a lamp, he says, and put it under a bushel or under a basket. What do you do with a lamp to light up a room? You put it on the lampstand up high where, you know, the light shines. You don't hide the lamp under something because the light can't shine. So Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, and Luke Luke talks about it too. He write, They both write about it. But in Matthew 5, Jesus says this, he says, you guys, he, he wrote to them, he said, verse 14, this is, this is when he was, um, before he had, he had uh, died, while well, he was alive, walking with his disciples, he said, you are a light, uh, a light of the world. He said, a city cannot, uh, set on a, hi- I'm sorry, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But you put it on a lampstand that it might give light to all those that are in the house. He says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. When it comes to light, uh, you know, he says, you guys, you're, you're just like you, you put a, a city on a hill to be seen. It's up there to, I mean, it's, you can see it from way off in the distance. The, the, a, a well-lit city, you're like, yeah, I can see that city from far away. He says, you guys are supposed to be like that. Your light's supposed to be seen from far away. People should look at you and go, wow, you got a really bright light about you. Look at that. Look at that. There's something, something, a, a, a light about you that, what, what is that? And hopefully, as you go through life and you grow in your faith in the Lord, you'll start having to happen more and more. In fact, some Christians, I tell them this, and they're like, um, I've never had that happen. And I'm thinking, wow. Are you doing it right? Yeah, are you doing it right? 
Maybe there's something we need to... Maybe you're putting your lamp under the basket, under the bushel, you know? Maybe you stuffed it under the bed or something. What, what, what did you do with the Lord? Did you just take him and, like, hide him? Because, you know, he's, he's supposed to shine. He's supposed to be shining out of you. And Jesus said, let your good works, your good works, they're, they're like a light to the world. When you're doing good works, you know what, people come up to us and we're, we're feeding the homeless on Sunday, and they're like, wow, that's a really good thing you do. We went to, the, today after Daniel's swim, we went to Katie's um, kind of, I guess, going away party to college. Is that what you call it? Birthday like, graduation. Birthday graduation going away. It was kind of like a combo party. But we, we went up and uh, after after the Hapuna swim, and the... The gals were sitting around with Jan, and I'm at the corner of the table just nomming away on the wonderful steaks that they did on the barbecue, and I'm listening to the girls talk, and the conversation rolled around to, you know, Jan's sitting there in her mind. She's at the party, but in her brain, she's, she's like, prepping for the meal tomorrow. And so one of the gals asked her something, and she's like, oh, I'm, you know, you know, I, I do a feeding tomorrow for 100, 200 people, and... Um, you know, got to get the stuff prepped and just kind of like, you know, get my mental prep list or whatever. Some comment, she, I wasn't really, I was kind of eating and I heard a little bit of it. And, and, and all of a sudden I was like, that's a really good thing you do. That's amazing. Uh, you, you guys are the one on the beach, aren't you? The church down there. You do that every week and I'm just cracking up because I'm listening to this lady who doesn't profess to go to church or anything. She's like, that's a really good light to our community. I was like, yeah. That, see, when you're doing the stuff of, of the Lord, the good works of the Lord, your light, your good works shine like light to people. And they see that. And if you've never had anybody say to you, wow, you, you just have a light. Or uh, in Hawaii, when I first got here, it was, you have a glow. You you have a your aura. That's the new agey term that was very popular when I got here. Twenty four twenty four years ago, all I heard was aura, aura, aura. I go in KTA. You have a golden aura. You have a, a white light about you. You know you have such. And I just go, oh, thanks. That's the Lord. Because He's called the light of the world, and and I asked Him to come into me, and so. You know, it's his light shining through through my life. It gave me great opportunities to tell people about Jesus. Like, you see that light? Great. You know, that's what it's all about. When we study these seven letters to the seven churches, pay attention to what God is going to speak through his son. Jesus is going to say to some of the churches, you know, I, I'm, I called you to be a lamp. You know, church is the, the actual lamp for the light to be in. But some of them, their light isn't going to be very good. And he's going to tell them, you need to repent. Make your light bright like it used to be. Or else I'm going to come and I'll be there as your judge. And it, some people just like gloss right over it. But the seven letters to the seven churches are powerful. Because they get people, you know, if you're doing good, it commends you and tells you keep it up. If you're not doing good, what's it tell you? Straighten up. Straighten up. You know, and the next um, two chapters, chapter two and three into four, really key in on the church. Different things that come up in different churches. We've got seven different churches to study coming up. I'm going to just do like one each week. The church at Ephesus, you know, I'll do one at a time and I'll teach you guys some of the stuff that was going on in those churches and the stuff Jesus says to them and the stuff, the stuff he tells them, you know, if they did good how he commended them, if they did bad, how, what he tells them, call, he calls them to repent. And if he, if they, and he tells them if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And so some of them are really sobering, like don't want to go there. It's enough to make me go, pay attention, this is good, <laughs> this is really important, make sure you don't do this one, you know, make sure you, make sure you do it right. And, it, and when we're all done, I'm going to try to do it in a way to help you guys, um, like, be able to recall it. What's what's the main message to Ephesus? What's the main message to Thyatira? What's the main message to Sardis? You know, 
so that because there's a reason I like to do it this way. Once you know all of the main messages, and and you you'll start seeing some pretty cool things that you'll you would otherwise miss out later in the book. But if you get them down, you'll be able to like for the rest of your Christian walk, they'll serve you really well to help you grow more and more in your faith. And you, I believe, all of you guys will be a brighter light for the Lord. As you learn, you know, what does he, what does Jesus say to his church? Because that's what's coming up. G- guys, it ain't going to be John talking. The next part we're turning to is Jesus talking. Jesus says, write down, write this down. And he's going to write down what Jesus tells him to write down. So it's, it, it's going to be the words of Jesus to that church. The words of Jesus to the next church. The words that, so... I don't know about you, but when it comes to hearing messages, I like to hear, more than anything, I like to hear Jesus' message to his church. I mean, who who better to give the message than the Lord himself? I mean, preachers are okay, but if you get a choice, read Revelation 2 and 3 and you get Jesus' words himself from this Jesus that we just read about. Okay, so pay attention. If you can remember this for next week, it's not the humble Lamb of God that took on the human flesh. He doesn't really look that way, does he, anymore? White hair like wool, face shining like the sun, eyes flames of fire, robe, you know, the whole sash thing. He's got it going on here, okay? This is, by the way, for if you ever share with a Jewish friend, and they're like, I don't know, you know, because we believe in the Messiah, we just want the one, the, the one that comes in power. You go, oh, I know which one he is. And you can point out the powerful Messiah, the, the, the triumphant one that comes and delivers from oppression. Right here. Just read him. You don't have to say where you're reading from. Just, oh, yeah. You mean the one that's like eyes of flames of fire and like his voice is like thundering and his, 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 his coming out of his mouth like a sharp two-edged sword. It's like, yeah, we want that guy. Why do they want that guy? Are the Jews being picked on today, do you guys think? Just a little. Just a little. <laughs> do you think they're not waiting for the Messiah to come, who's like the powerful one that was promised? See, what they, did, what they don't get, guys, is that Jesus, it, it, they look at it as there's two Messiahs. One, the, the wimpy servant that takes away sins and suffers like a suffering lamb. And then the other powerful one that delivers us from all the oppression. What they don't get is that they they actually teach there's two different guys. They believe that there's two, one to take care of sin's issue, one to take care of getting us out of this physical oppression. They just don't understand. It's the same guy. He just comes twice. They wouldn't, and you know why they don't get it is, what part do they miss out on? What's the big key that they miss out on the, to the Jews. The Messiah would come and die. They just miss out on what happened three days later. What happened three days later after he died? He rose. The power of the resurrection is the key that makes a lot of Jews not know. They just don't know that one part. They're like, yeah, we know he died. Happened in Jerusalem. He's yeah, like, yeah, we learned that in school. We all know that. And I'm like, did they not teach you what happened three days later? You know, the big Roman cover-up and the and the, the whole, you know, the Sanhedrin paying off the uh, guards and, and, and saying, don't worry, we'll just keep it. Just say his disciples came and stole the body. Tell everyone that, because it's going to really upset the whole country if you start saying the dude rose from the dead. But we know he rose from the dead. And that's why his introduction here in Revelation is, I am the living one. Okay? I was dead, he says, and now I'm what? I'm alive. So the resurrection part and the and that powerful delivering guy are tied together in Jesus. He's the same uh, Messiah just come twice. That's the key that unlocks it for a lot of Jews today. When they're like, well, I've heard about Jesus, I'm going to stay a little bit. 
I don't, I don't really get the significance. I'm like, you didn't get the resurrections part, did you? They didn't, they don't, they're not really kind of clued in on that part. And all you got to do is, is point that out to them. And when they see it, and the light comes on in their brain, they go, oh. Now, because they, the, they want the Jesus we just read about with that, with that power and that voice and that, you know, that, that ability to deliver. They want him. They just don't know that he's the same guy who came and died first. I was here before he's telling them. I'm back. And if anyone would know that, wouldn't John know that? Since he saw him 60 years before? But in 60 years, do you think, like John's been banished, he's out there on the island, and now he gets to see Jesus, and Jesus isn't looking the same as, you know, 60 years earlier. Jesus is looking really good. I mean, but like, whoa, you know? But it just frees, it, to me, it's amazing. He looks so, I think what he did is he just took away the, you know, that, that humble blindings. Um, maybe it was in their thinking or maybe it was just he made it where he peeled back the mask to let him see who he really was when he was risen. And they went, oh, wow, that's, that's the Jesus we're going to see coming in the sky. So you might as well get used to this description. The one with the sharp two-edged sword and the eyes of flame of fire. And face like the sun. I mean, he's going to be bright. He's not going to be like tone it down. And I don't care what, what sunglasses you have. I don't think it's going to it's gonna be able to block out his, his, his light. I mean, he's going to be bright. Now, he's bright. The angels that are in his right hand, seven, are stars bright? I mean, really, are, is a star bright? They say a star is brighter than the sun that we look at. just happens to be way farther away, right? So they have these, they're just like, some people go, those are just suns in other galaxies way far away. And I'm like, um, Jesus holds seven of them in his hand. I never held seven stars. This is pretty trippy. How, how big is God's hand? Do you guys know? There's a, there's a description of it in the Old Testament. His hand spans from from the span of his hand. It says tip of his thumb to his pinky. What 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 fits in the span of his hand in the Psalms? I think it's Psalms that says this. You can look it up for me and put it in the video. What fits in the span of his hand? Do you guys know? The universe. The, universe. In, the whole world in his hands. He's got the, the universe. I mean, he's got the whole entire universe. Just he can palm it like a basketball. God goes, got it. Plunk. I mean, that's cool. When, when you think, okay, God, I want to entrust my life to you, but I'm not sure if you could handle it. He's going, look, I got I got you. You know, I got the whole universe right here. Don't worry about it. I can handle what you're going through. I mean, it just helps me. I don't know about you, but it helps my faith to trust in the Lord because I can say, Cool. You're so powerful. You've got the whole universe in your hand. Just in the span of your hand. Someone come in? Come on in, Lou. We're just finishing up, so... This this is the intro to the to the book, basically, of Revelation. Next week, um, let's do the first letter to the first church, Ephesus. And uh, you guys, it just like a couple paragraphs long, but I'm going to try to teach it so you really get it down solid and I'll show you some other things about you know there is actual letter in the Bible to the church of Ephesus we call it the book of Ephesians that Paul wrote so I'll use some of those things that he points out to help you kind of tie once you know that like book of, if you know the book of Ephesians you're going to already there, there's a key passage in the book of Ephesians about the full armor of God have you guys heard that one yeah. well just keep that in mind, and I'll see if I can maybe tie in something just to help you help you remember some of the stuff um, when it comes to the church at Ephesus. So, anyway, that's it. Let's pray, and uh, we'll come back and study some more next week, and give thanks and seek the Lord continually together. So, Lord, thank you for this time, and I pray that as we spend the rest of the evening in fellowship and and getting ready for church tomorrow 
that you would just um, give us a great night. And let us just grow in our knowledge of your son Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. And ask that in his precious name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen.